Great, I just want to say a quick welcome. Uh, so welcome to the London Institute. This is UK's uh, only independent research institute for mathematics. And so we, uh, this year we actually moved into the Royal Institution. This is, so you're right now, this is Michael Faraday's living room. His bedroom is right there. It's, you know, this is the suite that Faraday is in living. So everything you have here is what Faraday is like. This is Faraday, so we're really happy to host a lot of teams. And I hope that we will be hosting a lot of people now. Um, it's, it's what a turnout. This is amazing, right? I mean, I think- uh, That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's really growing a crowd. In fact, in fact, Royal Institution drew such a crowd back in the day because it was public facing. That Albemarle Street outside is the first one-way street in London. It was there was such a traffic that I had to control it by making it the first one-way street. So this is continuing this tradition. So welcome, and I hope to see you all uh, regularly from now. Over to so good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming today. We are very happy about the panel. Uh, I have the joy of introducing Damian Galante for the first set of in-person monthly lectures. So these lectures were created to foster a sense of community in London, to give uh, support for incoming PhD students in London, to learn new topics taught by researchers based in London, so that we could have a sense of community and go beyond the difference between the different universities. And we're very happy to have so many people here today. And Damien will be teaching us for quite for a bit about uh, the SYK yeah. model. Uh, it's a very interesting. Uh, set of lectures on the image of space time is even more relevant because Damian here is a Stephen Hawking fellow. And it's very nice to have a Stephen Hawking fellow teaching us in the uh, apartment where Faraday lives, <laughs> in the middle of London. I think that's a big embodiment of what we wanted to do with Lumpy to use all this amazing capacity that we have in London. And so, I have a choice to you. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much for the nice introduction, the invitation, and all that. It's quite an honor to be here writing this short in Faraday's living room. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone. Um, well, you know the title already, it's SYK and the emergence of uh, space time, a little bit about holography. Um, yeah, how should I start? So my idea was to do a short introduction so everyone can introduce themselves. The idea is that this should be super informal. We are in a living room, sitting in very comfortable uh, sofas. So I want this to be informal. Wh whenever you want, just ask whatever you'd like to ask. And if I can answer, I will answer. Um, so yeah, I was thinking to do a round of introductions, but maybe we are too many people, but okay. Uh, let's do it. So I have more or less a feeling of uh, who you are, where are you from, and what are you working. So tell me your name, where are you from, and what are you working on if you are working on something. I will start. I'm Damian. I'm a postdoc at King's College. Uh, and as I will be telling you, I work in holography and related topics. I'm Lorenzo. I'm a PhD and I work in numerical relativity for ADS CFT, but on the ADS side. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Gilbert. Uh, I am completely uh, the complete memory of emergency, and I'm working in uh, a numerical relativity also in uh, uh, binary group bad forms and, um, and um, alternatives. With Bao, right? You know. Well, I'm a PhD things, and I'm working in the database for uh, any possible. I'm Alma, also Kings, and I'm working on the surface operators. And I'm here with the coach, also at Kings, and I'm working on a uh, analytical platform. Uh, and I am also at Kings, and I'm working on a compass and I'm Sam, I'm also at Kings. Uh, <laughs> Kings Troop. And I work with a lot of Damian on the group. You can mix up next time. We can have people yeah, from yeah. different places sitting on different. <laughs> I'm Matt, another King's person, and I'm doing a two-dimensional CFTs. Hi, I'm Vladimir. I'm also a King's person. I'm working on conformal field theories in more than two dimensions. Uh, I'm Jake. Did you guess where I'm from? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I work on each group and two And then I am also a King's, and I work on conformal field theories. I'm 
Okay, great. So <laughs> lots of variety, lots of universities also, that's good. Lots of kings people as well. <laughs> um, okay, so the plan of the lectures is to be like uh, super basic. So if you work on holography, maybe you will get a bit bored during the first uh, part of it. Uh, so there will be four lectures. And the plan will be roughly today, it will be mostly intro and motivation. So why are we interested in this problem of emergent space time? What's that problem? Um, and all this about uh, what is SYK model? Why do we care? Why should we work in, in two dimensions and not in four or five? Um, um, yeah. Hopefully this will give like a big overview of uh, why are we doing what we are doing. And from next class onwards, uh, we can start uh, studying things a little bit more. So I will start with the whole, whole lectures in holography have two parts. There's a gravity part and there's a quantum part. And so I will start with the gravity part first because I think, well, I feel it's easier. Um, so next lecture we'll talk about uh, JT gravity and this thing called uh, near ADS2 uh, space times. And so this will be like the first half of it. Um, third and fourth, I will tell you about these uh, mysterious letters, SYK model. Yeah, and the way I want to show you this is just well, for today, SYK will be just a very simple uh, quantum mechanical model of, of fermions given by some Hamiltonian where these fermions uh, start interacting. So there's nothing crazy going on. There are no black holes, no wormholes, no space time. Everything happens just at a single point in, in space. And there's only time. So this point is evolving in time. Um, and we will study some properties of this model. And hopefully, when we get to lecture four, we'll see if the living room is still full or not. Uh, 
but we will see how we get um, ADS2 physics from, from SYK in some, some special limits. So the idea is that we start with this simple uh, quantum model with no space, only time. And in this model in some limit where there are lots of fermions and where it, they start uh, strongly interacting, uh, give rise to a spatial dimension and we get the physics of uh, ABS2 space time. That's the plan. Um, this and well, they told me that these long lectures should have a clear computational goal. So you come out of this with something uh, done. And so the main goal is to do some computations and eventually show that the thermodynamics and certain correlate, correlation functions in SYK um, well, let's just put in the infrared, we'll see what that means. Um, are those of a black hole, whatever that means, in two dimensions, in ADS. Okay, clear, easy, amazing. Um, this will be intended for first year PhD students. So I will assume uh, that you just know basics of uh, GR and QFT. Um, I wrote things that you need to know. I probably won't write them down, but you need to know what a rich scalar is, what's a killing vector, the Einstein action, that's it, QFT, green function, Feynman diagrams. A little bit about conformal symmetry. Oh, Nadav. We are using Nadav Flex today. Paradise living room, laundry lectures. A little bit. <laughs> uh, but I won't assume that you know like uh, string theory or supersymmetry or ABS CFT or anything like that. So it will be just some simple computations and hopefully um we'll understand that the, the computations on both sides of the duality are kind of the of the same thing all right uh, let me write some references so if you want to read us at home you know where to look at um so there are very nice lecture notes uh, by Gabor Sarossi. They are called, I don't know how they are called, ADS2 Holography and SYK. Uh, number is 171108 482. And yeah, this. Uh, will basically, I mean, I won't be following any particular lecture, but this will summarize most of the things that I will be talking about, maybe in a different order or in a different way. Um, and then, okay, um, the ADS2 part was originally written in this paper by Maldacena, Stanford, and Yang. And uh, that's 1608, 01857. Um, and the SYK model has an interesting story that I might tell you later, uh, but I won't be referring to any SY or K paper, but again to a Maldacena and Stanford paper. And um, this is 1604. Um, whoop, 
seven eight one eight. And the story is that Kitaya went to a conference one day and said, oh, I found a little model of fermions and I think there's a black hole there. But he never wrote a paper. Uh, and so probably those lectures are the most cited <laughs> lectures in the history of physics just because nobody cites lectures. Well, it wasn't even a lecture, it was just a talk at the conference. Uh, but he never wrote the paper. And then these people wrote down those ideas in this paper. Uh, and that's now the, the standard reference for that. Uh, as you see, this happened like uh, five or six years ago. Uh, and by now, there are lots of other things. There are some nice uh, video lectures by Douglas Stanford that you can find on YouTube. Vladimir Rosenhaus also has some nice uh, lecture notes. There's some other by Dimitri Chunin. And yeah, you can find lots of uh, places where to look at this. Um, so that's for plan references and goals. I think, well, is this clear? Are there questions? All right, so given that we are the royal institution of the Great Britain. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. Uh, when are the next elections taking place? Ah, yeah, so this will be, uh, it's February, today is 21st, right? Then it's 28th, and then it's March uh, 7th and 14th. And there's a possibility of having an extra or including on those four a lecture by Nikolai Gromov, that is our mathematical genius at King's. And so he might uh, tell you how to do all the computations that I will be describing in mathematics. Maybe. He's going to make a video. Ah, he's going to make a video. Well, okay, so you, you will be able to find online an online lecture by Nikolai showing how to do these computations in mathematics. I think the lessons are recorded. Uh, they are recorded. We'll see how how the recording comes out after this. I'm recording with this mic that I never tried. Um, they will be on YouTube, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and they all will be here at 10.30 and there will be pizza afterwards. Uh, yeah. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, am I missing any other details? Yeah, no, I think that's all. Any other question? Okay, uh, so I will start by talking a bit about the history of theoretical phys physics. My master's students already heard this during my first lecture of my foundations module, but given that we are here at the Royal Institution where Kelvin gave his speech, I plan to tell the story again. So it is uh, 1900, and for many, physics was almost over. There were four building blocks. We have on one side Newton's gravity, relativity. But this was Galileo's relativity. Maxwell that gave us electromagnetism. Uh, so electricity, magnetism, optics, all in one. And then we have the great laws of uh, thermodynamics, pushing the Industrial Revolution. And so Lord Kelvin comes to this building and gives a speech that I don't remember the title because I have it on my slides that I'm not uh, showing, but he was telling something like, okay, uh, physics is more or less over. We have everything except uh, for two clouds. And these two clouds are around here, cloud one, was this uh, ether problem. There was with electromagnetism and relativity that they didn't get along too well. <laughs> There's an interesting quote that I like a lot in the 
in the speech, uh, when he finished explaining all this uh, cloud issue, he says, I'm afraid we must still regard cloud one as very dense. Uh, so there's a huge problem over there, and there was another huge problem over here um, that goes as the uh, the problem of the ultraviolet catastrophe in the black body radiation. When you want to compute the radiation of these uh, black bodies, the thermodynamics uh, in the ultraviolet, we get infinite, we do the experiment, we get something finite. Uh, so he gives this speech over here and he ends up, well, okay, this is what we have so far. Maybe they are just, well, the first cloud looks dense to him, but uh, other than that, the sky is pretty clear in, in physics. Um, as soon after this, you know what happened. So we put these two things together. Uh, we special relativity. And these two things led to quantum mechanics. And now we faced another problem, that is that Newton's gravity didn't get along with special relativity. So it took Einstein another 10 years to come with GR. And well, you already know this. When we put these two together, we end up with a QFT. And I guess in one way or another, we are all here because we would like to know what's here in the middle. We have different reasons to believe that there should be something over there. But in the maybe it's string theory, maybe it's not, but in the last. 20, 30, 40, 50, I don't know how many years, uh, we fail as a theoretical physicists to give a, a good answer to what's in that uh, uh, question mark. And so the idea of uh, holography is, uh, well, there are many different ways of presenting holography and probably many people here working on different aspects of holography will tell you or can tell you a different story, but the way I would like to see holography in this talk uh, is a way of thinking about this problem in, in a different way, uh, not thinking about uh, gravity as, as something fundamental, but instead as something emerging from, from this quantum theory. Uh, so this very fundamental theory will be some, some quantum theory, and in some limit where it interacts strongly, and there are many degrees of freedom, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know the exact rules yet. Uh, somehow, uh, space time appears, and the laws of, of gravity and, and GR uh, emerge from that uh, quantum, quantum system. Um, and so, of course, the history of that is very rich and let me give a few other historical remarks before going into the real stuff but probably big things happened in the 70s with the black hole entropy formula So the idea is that if we believe for now that this is true, that gravity is somehow emergent, then we should start asking about uh, the quantum side. What types of quantum systems allow for gravity uh, to emerge in some limit? And so uh, H-bar and G. Newton, Bekenstein Hawking, or the black hole entropy formula that is telling us that space-time somehow has an entropy, and that entropy has an h-bar over here. So we believe in Boltzmann. This is telling us that space-time is somehow, well, black holes are made up of quantum things. Uh, and not only that, but instead of the usual volume scaling of uh, the entropy, they also scale with the area. Um, so 
even if people weren't thinking about the holography in those days, this was kind of the first indication that that maybe what is happening is that the quantum system lives in less dimensions than, than the space-time. Um, and this formula is, well, somehow uh, counting an entropy in, in that quantum system. So from now onwards, I will forget about all the units. This is equal to one. I will keep sometimes uh, G Newton, sometimes I will skip it. Um, and then from here, um, people started thinking, okay, if black holes have entropy and they are somehow holographic, uh, then there were ideas that uh, gravity in general, space time should be holographic. It's not just about black holes, but it's a general property of uh, gravity. And so these are these ideas of, of Susskind and Etoff at the beginning of the uh, 1990s. Uh, and of course, we know in 88, Malacena comes up with this uh, amazing ABS CFT. So it's the first concrete example of of this holographic principle that we have in theoretical physics, it's gravity in ABS, uh, dual to CFT uh, in one less dimension. And I put a D over here. And even when they started in 98, they, they, they started trying to get examples in different dimensions, of course, the emblematic one is ABS5, dual to n equal four, uh, super young mills in four dimensions. Um, but uh, okay, there are examples in four dimensions, in three dimensions, and somehow the case of uh, two dimensions was uh, left abandoned. Um, there's another nice paper uh, by, it's also uh, 98, it's, it's quite amazing. Maldacena, uh, Michelson, and Strominger, where they say what's going on uh, with D, well, here it's D equals one. What's happening with ABS2? They call it the enigmatic case. Um, ABS2 is, well, we, We'll talk about ABS2 in a bit, but it's different to the rest of, of the other ABS space times. It has two boundaries, but it's, well, it's maybe the most relevant for our universe because it's the near horizon uh, geometry of near extremal black holes of the ones we observed in the sky. Um, well, also because of the supersymmetric black holes. I mean, ABS2 is important in theoretical physics and Yet, uh, it was left there uh, abandoned. Um, okay, so, and this is what we are going to study today or in the next lectures. It's holography in ABS2. Um, so, some short motivation uh, for ABS2. So, first one, uh, well, as I was telling you, the dual theory, or we hope, the dual theory is zero plus one dimensions. So there's no space. Uh, everything happens at a single point that kind of evolves in time. And this is nice, well, for, for two reasons, a little bit more philosophically, if we are talking about the emergence of space-time and we see gravity appearing from here, it is clear that 
space time is emerging because in the dual theory there's no space uh, to talk about so it's it's a nice place uh, to start this discussion but in some other sense it should also be the easiest and this is because the zero plus one quantum field theory is a quantum mechanical theory and so we will see it will have n degrees of freedom that are finite and it's much easier than than a QFT with all these infinite uh, degrees of freedom that uh, we if there are lots of symmetries and blah 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 we might uh, be able to compute certain things um, but it's much easier if we just have a quantum mechanical theory Hamiltonian we can put it in a computer we can, we can do lots of other uh, stuff that well we understand it's quantum mechanics with n degrees of freedom so in this sense uh, this holographic duality is uh, easier and computationally more tractable than the others and as we will see we will be able to to do computations that go from the very weak coupling where perturbation theory is valid all the way to strong coupling where where gravity appears and we will be able to follow the calculation all along the uh, the flow where usually uh, in the other types of uh, holography we either we can have well we can have a few terms if you are very good you can have many terms in perturbation theory you can have many terms coming from gravity but merging the two is usually uh, difficult especially when there are black holes and um, and that stuff okay um, the second reason that's the one I want to develop a little bit today is uh, this one that ADS2 appears quite universally as the near horizon region of nearly extremal black holes in higher dimensions so we will be studying two dimensions but uh, there's a motivation coming from from higher dimensional black holes as well um, and as I was telling you this last uh, well here I left 98 and this is gravity ABSD CFTD and the story comes back in 2015 with this uh, gravity in nearly ABS2 dual to these uh, quantum mechanical uh, systems like SYK. So this part of the story is much less developed and there are still lots of things um, to solve. And if you read the my app, so it's not the end of the story but, uh, it's a nice uh, toy model where we can do computations and understand this uh, emergence of space time from from the quantum perspective all right um, how am i doing are you hungry or ready or quarter past 11 and i started 10 30. Huh? Uh, well <laughs> OK, we'll see how it goes. So Mike, let me tell you what's the plan for today. And then we can decide how to. Are there questions of this? So today I wanted to do uh, three things. Uh, so show. How ADS2 uh, appears in near extreme black holes or extreme black holes. Then I wanted to talk a little bit about ADS2. What is it? Some of their properties. Uh, and finally, my last point. So you have some, something to think about for next lecture is uh, well how JP gravity theory appears from this um, near extremal limit of uh, near horizon limit of near extremal black holes. That's it.
that's the plan. So maybe I will start by doing this. Um, yeah, the charge black hole, and then we can stop for five minutes, and then. We'll... Okay. Sorry. I guess in one way or another, you knew this story already, and it's just me, maybe retelling it in a way that uh, will allow me to to motivate this problem. But uh, I thought it was a good idea to do it at the beginning of this. Um, okay, this is something that uh, maybe you also know, but maybe you forgot. So there are black holes. Maybe Nadab is teaching the master students about these black holes uh, that are charged. Uh, um, so you can think about uh, this theory. So consider this action in four dimensions. Uh, yeah, sometimes I will be I will be putting this L for Lorentzian. Sometimes I will put an E for Euclidean. Uh, depending on the type of calcul calculation that I'm doing. It's not very important for, for today. So say we have Einstein gravity and we add um, electromagnetic field, which is a square, and uh, well, eventually we might think about adding some matter. For now, uh, I want. So this theory admits some black holes as solutions. Uh, this theory admits uh, these solutions. So this is the metric on the round two sphere. Um, so A now is given by Q over R, there's some charge, and F of R. Am I doing this right? Yeah. So this is the Reisner Nordstrom solution. It's a charged black hole, it's characterized, well, here I'm putting G to one, I guess. Uh, M and Q. And I'm very bad at drawing pictures, so I had the Penrose diagram for this black hole in my computer. I can try, no, I won't try to. <laughs> uh, The, yeah, there are some funny things about the solution. First, that the singularity as r goes to zero, well, there's a different sign. It, it will be leading by this term, so it becomes, a, well, I never know, space-like instead of time-like. Um, the other way, time-like instead of space-like. And if we look at the horizons, uh, we have a quadratic equation, so this black hole has two solutions, so two horizons, the inner and the outer horizon, and they are given by Rh plus minus is equal to m plus minus root of uh, m squared minus q squared. So m is greater or equal than q. And we see, well, if q is zero, we get the usual Rh equals to 2m. Um, but in general, there will be these two horizons. Um, well, we can also compute the entropy according to the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. So we can do black hole entropy. It's the area uh, of the horizon. This gives uh, 4 pi Rh plus square. So this is, it ends up being 
Rh plus square over G Newton. Um, and this black hole also have a Hawking entropy that can be computed by taking the derivative of this blackening factor and evaluating it at Rh. I will probably put some exercise if you don't know how to compute these things. Uh, so you can convince yourself that whatever I'm writing is true. And we get these formulas over here, uh, Rh plus square. Okay. Um, so now we should look at these formulas and see that there are something very funny going on. And that is that when Rh goes to uh, Rh plus goes to Rh minus, so M goes to Q, and these two things uh, get together, the, the temperature of this black hole goes to zero, but Rh is still finite. So these black holes uh, still have a finite entropy, still have a finite uh, black, black hole horizon, but uh, their entropy is going to zero. Uh, and these are the, the so-called uh, extremal black hole uh, solutions. Okay, so let's see how the geometry of these black holes uh, look when we zoom close to the horizon. So we want to take the limit uh, of M close to Q. This means Rh plus is similar to Rh minus. Uh, and this means that uh, the Hawking temperature of this thing is close to zero. Uh, and in order to go close to the horizon, we need to define the small parameter, and small parameters are called epsilon. And we will write it uh, dimensionless uh, units so that we can take the limit of epsilon going to zero. And okay, there are different ways of taking this limit. I will take the one where I keep the charge fixed and finite, um, and then I take epsilon to zero. And so if we expand this uh, Rh in this limit, we get that Rh plus is something like uh, Q plus root two epsilon plus higher order corrections. And now I want to see, well, the metric that I just erased, how it looks when, when R is close to Rh. So consider a change of coordinates where my radial coordinate goes like uh, one. So this is Rh, more or less. And I add, well, a small raw piece. This is just a change of coordinates and I will just scale time so that the limit is well defined. And I will put tau over here. And if I plug this change of coordinates into my metric that I wrote before, the answer is d squared over q squared. It's minus rho d tau square plus d rho square over rho square plus the uh, omega two square. So famously, this is the metric of ABS2. And this is the metric uh, of the two sphere. And both have the same radius. So the radius of this uh, square and the ABS, they are all given by this Q squared and they are fixed uh, and the same. And people sometimes uh, draw these diagrams where very far away you have flat space time and then you get closer to the horizon 
and you get this uh, throat. And so here, this, uh, these circles are, are getting this, this S2 over here. Um, well, Heidi S2 has an infinitely deep throat. And if you try to compute um, the distance from, from here to whatever the horizon is, you will see that this is infinitely long and scales like uh, log epsilon. The epsilon goes away. So if, yeah, if I, I just put the epsilon there in, in the time so that uh, it goes away, the metric. Okay, and let me do one more calculation. Uh, okay, if I compute how the temperature and the and the entropy look as a function of this epsilon, well, when epsilon is strictly zero, I am in the, the extremal case; it has no entropy. But if I turn a little bit of epsilon, uh, then I'm left with something like this. I Q plus order epsilon. Um, the entropy goes like pi Q squared. This is the leading term. No, it's uh, well, I erase it, but it was RH uh, squared. And the correction is uh, again uh, root epsilon. And root epsilon appears here, so I can change this root epsilon for temperature. And then I get that the, the entropy of these black holes has a finite piece that I will call S0, given by pi q squared over gn. Uh, and then they will be corrected by some uh, linear in t term. So this is 4 pi squared over g newton q. And this was one of the of the mysteries that uh, that ended up with uh, this uh, SYK story. Near extremal black holes have some entropy that is linear in T, and as we will see soon, if we study ABS2, the ABS2 the isometries of ABS2 are the conformal group. Uh, and so in a conformal theory, uh, there are no scales to, to uh, cancel this uh, linear in T temperature. So how is it going? How, how are we going to get this linear in T term from, from ABS2? Was one of these uh, questions that uh, Maldacena, Strominger, and Michelson were asking uh, back in 98 uh, in this paper that I was uh, telling you. So a lot of, of the story that will come later is about trying to understand this linear in temperature piece in the in the entropy of uh, near extremal black holes. Sorry, yep. Well, it's a it's a funny limit. <laughs> so so yeah when. Okay, so epsilon going to zero is the, the purely the extremal case. And then it doesn't, this is zero and this is zero. And then you would say, okay, what if I have a, a finite, uh, well, not a finite, but a, an infinitesimal epsilon? And then uh, the, um, the horizon gets corrected, and these things only depend on, on the horizon. And so you can think about some solution that is ABS2 crosses 2 slightly corrected so that uh, the things give, give this. Other questions? And in knowledge plus that's on outside of the bridge. Um, I think, well, what did I do? Uh, no, it's probably inside. Let's see. Yeah, I think it's inside.
Yeah. More? There are corrections in the matrix that we had an epsilon. Yeah, there will be corrections. Higher order in epsilon. And eventually this will break down, right? When this term becomes of order one, then, okay, this uh, breaks down and eventually you, you get to this asymptotic region of flat space. All right. Uh, so we started in 4D with a charged black hole. We look close to the horizon uh, in this funny limit where the temperature goes to zero. And we found that, that that's described by an ABS2 throat. Um, and yeah, what I, well, and this is, yeah, I didn't say, but this is something universal. So any black hole that admits an extremal limit will have a throat that is of this type with an ABS2 factor. Um, so that's kind of the importance of, of ABS2. Uh, I also heard someone that always tells me that whenever someone asks, what are you doing holography, ABS is not our real world, blah, blah, blah. You just tell them, well, look at the sky. There are some black holes. They are highly spinning. So close to the horizon of these black holes, you will find ABS2. So we are doing real, <laughs> real world physics. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> You're fine with that. Well, at some point in your career, you will have to explain to someone <laughs> that this is very important. Uh, so that's another reason for ABS2. Uh, and okay, my plan uh, for now is to explain a little bit the geometry of ABS2, look at the symmetries, look at the different uh, patches, coordinate systems that we will be using. Uh, next class, but maybe it's a good time to do a small break, order some pizzas, and then. Ah, okay. So I have five minutes. Or not? Ah, okay. Let, yeah, let's do a five minute break, and then we can. Finish. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, for the picture, I want, I want to send you a few words on the ideas for the geometry, and then uh, we can start uh, analyzing the theory. So, I guess you have some idea of what the ideas is, but so this idea two is the maximally. Symmetric, symmetric rest time with negative curvature to be and the first time off from Phantom diagram is hard to draw, but this one is pretty simple. This is idea two. And I will put some coordinates to this. Uh, so, what so we analyze the metric, there will be a new coordinate that I will usually call global time. There will be a sigma coordinate over here. Um, and so, there are a set of global coordinates. Uh, that um, basically cover the full Penrose diagram that is given by d square minus the mu square plus the sigma square over sine square of sigma. And sigma here goes from zero to pi, and both at zero and at pi, uh, the metric uh, diverges, and this is the use of uh, conformal boundary of previous. As I was telling you before, here we have two different points where this uh, diverges. So, ABS2 has 
ideas two loops like a black hole and these coordinates only cover well, this triangle over here and uh, this regular patch and we usually yeah uh, we usually call this the ideas two black hole even though in two dimensions there's no singularity or anything but it's just that the uh, observer here close to the boundary, it has only access to, to this patch of, of space time, uh, and we call that the ideas that hold. For the patch, is usually useful for creation, it's simple. So it's a maximized symmetric space time in two dimensions, so that means there are three feeding vectors. So for our students in the audience, I will write those down. And um, your exercise is to compute all the, the new brackets. Sorry, silly question. Yeah. Is that a T or tau? Which one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I well most times I will just put T. That's how it works. Every time I'm changing the and I'm changing uh, yeah. that uh, yeah. well, also kind of multiplying. R square minus one. So in, in all these uh, um, notice metrics, I'm putting the first an extra variable that is the length of ADS, and I'm putting it to one. Uh, and that's why I'm in the one up here. Yeah. Yeah, everything is the same. <laughs> and yeah, but yeah, somehow related to that is that, uh, yeah, let me just write it down and then Uh, none of these coordinates. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry, the, the metric in none of these coordinates looks like the one we derived from the. Ah, yeah, we well, it is. We can go. Well, I 
Or you, or you want to do like cut it in half? I want to do half like this one. Half like this one. That's why you're doing your ideas. Like this one. We have a zero. Yeah. It's um, three. It's about the hard time to do. It's about the hard time to ball. The ball is to Okay, so we have so many times, nothing else, one. Yeah. Uh, okay, more questions? And this, uh, Mike, are you wearing the mask? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Such a good microphone that might have taken me. Okay, well, you, you can imagine what I was talking about in the last 15 or 20 minutes, I don't know. Uh, so killing vectors, there's translations, there's dilatations, there's a crazy, okay. No, no. Say it again. Well, it's one coordinate change yeah. that gives me this patch. Uh, the interesting thing is that that looks like a black hole, right? Well, There's a horizon. The horizon, the horizon. The horizon is at r equals to one. Yeah. In these coordinates, so uh, constant R slices look like this. Mm -hmm. um, this is within. It's well, yeah. If you go in 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 Poincaré coordinates, you don't see any horizon. But, yeah. And um, okay, yeah, there are, you, you can start thinking about different patches now that, uh, are, yeah, crazy things that uh, I mean, yeah, you, you can change coordinates as much as you like. You will get different patches, maybe yes, too. But these coordinates will be all related by these uh, transformations. So let me write down uh, killing vectors now. So there are two that are very simple to see in well for for this I will just look at this metric so it's independent of time so this should be a symmetry and then there's another that is kind of uh, similar to see that is scale time and z in the same way that leaves the metric unchanged um, the killing vector for that is something said this said and then we have another one that I won't explain, but you can check that this is symmetry. And it's usually associated with these uh, special conformal transformations that look something like this, I think. Uh, T, something like this. And so you can check, you can do uh, your Lee bracket computations and check that this close in an algebra that is sl 2 r I don't know where to write it down. So now you can do these things and you can check. This is just, yeah, for you to have an idea from where um, SL2R comes from. Usually people like to do the embedding picture where ADS2 is just a hyperboloid in R2,1. Uh, this is an equivalent way of saying the same thing. Um, 
Okay, that's homework. So that that's true, or if not, correct me. There might be some some numbers. Um, and so that's the yeah, SL2R algebra. So the isometries of ABS2 uh, conform this group. That is the conformal group in well, the conformal group in one dimension. Um, what else? Ah, yeah, another way of showing this is that, uh, and this is kind of related to what you were asking about different patches and different um, regions of ABS2. So you can show that if you do this transformation, so Z plus minus T going to A, Z plus minus T plus B over C, Z plus minus T plus D. Uh, this leaves this uh, Poincaré patch coordinates unchanged, provided that oh, a times D minus B times C is equal to one. Okay. And the last thing that uh, we will be needing for our story is to do Euclidean ABS2. So this is a bit more esoteric, but we will take T going to I Euclidean time. We will rotate time. Uh, and we add the periodicity to this uh, Euclidean time. And so the strip becomes a circle that I won't write because I'm very bad, but Escher was a very nice <laughs> uh, drawer of these uh, hyperbolic things. So this is the hyperbolic disk. And it's the usual picture that you find in holography with uh, you getting more and more as you get to the boundary, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so you, well, okay. There are usual coordinates that I will be using there, but uh, I will introduce them later because I don't have space in the, the blackboard. Okay, so this is a quick uh, summary of, of ABS2. And um, the last thing I want to tell you today is uh, what's wrong with ABS2. So, so far, everything looks fine. It's just kind of a particular example of all the other ABSD. It has one extra boundary, but that's not too much of a problem. Uh, and the problem of ABS2 is more a problem of uh, two dimensional gravity, I think. And so let's put uh, 2.1. Uh, what's wrong with ABS2? And the problem is that 2D gravity is kind of, well, Einstein gravity in two dimensions is kind of uh, topological. And so it's not a, a very interesting theory to work with. So say that, that we want uh, a theory of gravity um, that has ABS2 as a solution. So the first thing you can imagine is the Einstein-Hilbert action in two dimensions. So root G times R. And if we, well, yeah. If we are talking with manifolds with a boundary, we need to add this extrinsic curvature term to have a, a well-defined, well, I didn't want to put H, a well-defined variational problem. So it, this is the action. Uh, but the problem in two dimensions is that if you compute this for any metric, uh, this will be just a constant. It will be 2 pi, I think, times Chi e, where chi e is this uh, Euler characteristic of, of the manifold. This is topological. Every metric uh, could give just chi and nothing more than that. 
Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, another way of saying this is that if you compute the equations of motion, you know what the equations of motion for the Einstein Hilbert metric gives. So if you vary this action with respect to the metric, uh, well, you just get the usual Einstein equation, R mu nu minus one half G mu nu R. Uh, but the problem that is that in two dimensions, for any metric, you have R mu nu equals to one half G mu nu R. This you can prove as a homework. Um, and so the Einstein's equations uh, vanish uh, identically for any metric. So this is uh, identically zero. So it has ADS2 as a solution, but so it has all other metrics as a solution. And so the, there's, there are a lot of solutions to this, to this theory, way too many. Uh, and we don't want that. Um, and that's problematic. And say now that, uh, well, usually in ADS-CFT, we like to couple uh, gravity to some matter theory. So usually we add S matter over here. But then the variation of this action will give me here some, some T mu nu. And the Einstein equation will be telling me that this T mu nu has to be zero. And, and this is something quite arbitrary that I can, I can put into the equations, whatever matter I, I like. And so this is another way of saying the same thing that I've been saying in all this uh, part, uh, is that gravity is over constrained in two dimensions. Um, so you cannot even put whatever matter you'd like to, to couple uh, gravity to. So this is a bit problematic for a theory of ABS2. Um, is it okay if we just want to have some constant that, that will compute, if we talk about entropy, that will compute the ground state entropy, it will give a number, and that's it. But we will never be able to compute excitations. We will never be able to get this linear in T term that I was talking before. Just a theory of uh, ground states and, and nothing more than that. This K was the analog of K, yeah, we will talk about this K uh, next lecture. It's called the extrinsic curvature and it's the, the curvature induced at the, at the boundary. H is the induced metric yeah. on the boundary, and K is the, the extrinsic curvature on the boundary. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so yeah. Uh, say that again. Yeah. So, so you are proposing adding terms, boundary terms here. Yeah. Yeah. You you can do that. Uh, we, we will see that we will. We'll, well, that doesn't change the equations of motion, right? Because they are all boundary terms. So this is all still this is all still valid. Um, but it's true that in 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 holography, especially, sometimes uh, we need to add terms over here at the boundary to break, it will it will appear soon. But for the sake of of this argument, boundary terms are not not important. Other? Okay, so exact ADS2 uh, looks like a bit of a problem. 
And in order for this uh, JT gravity to appear, uh, uh, we have to move a little bit away from, from exact ABS2. Um, so, Sorry. yes. Um, yeah, yeah, but it's the embed. So you are embed. It's embedding on this end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's well defined. So I will write it down first a little bit pictorially, and then we'll do one more calculation. And after that, I hope the pizza will arrive. Um, so the idea we have this picture over here where we have asymptotically flat for the Minkowski space time, and eventually we get into some throat. And the size of these uh, circles over here were uh, giving the size of, of the S2. And in the extremal solution, we had ABS2 cross S2, where the radius of this uh, sphere was the same one everywhere. Um, and so the idea that these people have that it comes again from the higher dimensional picture is to think that the size of these uh, well, circles here or spheres in higher dimensions uh, varies uh, slightly as we move uh, across the ABS. So they are almost constant, but they have a small uh, change in, in, size, in size. So if we talk about the, the area of these things, I will have some big phi naught over here. And now I would like to consider uh, small variations of this area given by this phi, where I will always be taking phi naught to be much greater than, than phi. So I will still have this ABS2 throat, and I will still have an ABS2, but now the size of the ABS2 is not constant, but almost. Uh, constant. Yeah, exactly. The, this is the area. Yeah, it's Q. It will be re in the higher dimensional case. In the higher, in the charge black hole, it will be related to Q square. Yeah. And yeah, okay. So from here, it might look like it came from anywhere. But if we start again, we go back to our previous uh, Einstein-Maxwell action, and we see how that looks close to the horizon of near extremal uh, black holes, we will see that uh, this structure appears there quite naturally. So let me sketch that calculation, and, and then we are done for today. So we are back with this. Einstein Maxwell action D for X G R minus And now we will assume some spherically symmetric ansatz. So D square people in, in string theory like to do these compactifications a lot. Um, so I have a two-dimensional metric with some coefficient here, some metric h i j, and then I have the the, the two sphere that instead of having a constant uh, size, it will have e to the two psi, psi uh, radius, or well, e to the e to the psi radius, e to the two psi radius squared, and then F has to be something like this. It's not very important at this point. Um, 
Okay, and now we plug these ansatz into this action and we do the, the angular integrals. And we get an action that looks more or less like this. So this is again homework. Now it's a two dimensional metric. It has H here, the two dimensional metric. R square appears here, the Ricci scalar for H. And this is psi squared plus two, important. And another term that will be subleading in this discussion, which is minus two psi uh, Q squared. Okay, and this uh, starts looking more what we want. So now let's call it to the psi. Let's call it phi, the full dilaton. Um, well, okay. Uh, what we are going to call e to the two psi equals to phi. Um, and so in the extremal case, this will be phi naught. But now we would like to move a little bit away and add uh, another small phi. And we will work that action in perturbations around uh, big phi naught. Uh, and compute things uh, order by order in, in phi. And so if we do that, well, here I'm forgetting about uh, boundary terms again, sorry. So boundary. If we do that again, and the boundary will be quite important in all this ABS2 business, but we will see that uh, next lecture. So if we do this, we end up with uh, what we call the JT gravity theory. So there will be one term that we have phi naught. No, no, the boundary term that will appear in 2D. No, this is a 4D. This is a 4D action, that's fine. Yeah. It will have some boundary term that will be K, and yeah. you need to reduce that K, and it will become a boundary action. Oh, part of that will become a boundary action in 2D, right? Well, actually, here, yeah, here it's uh, Minkoff, yeah. Okay, yeah, so here I don't have any boundary term. The boundary term will appear here, but uh, now I'm not sure how it will appear. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I have to think about that. Yeah, this is Minkowski, there's no boundary term, but somehow in the in the two-dimensional action, uh, I have boundary terms because I have ABS. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So my. Yeah, but it's just that they. It, yeah, but that one won't yeah, contribute. That, that, won't contribute. that, that won't contribute in flat space. But here, the only thing I'm doing is. Uh, no, maybe I'm not. No, I'm just integrating the sphere here. Yeah. Why? Yeah, okay, I will think about it. But in this action, there's the boundary term that it's important and will play a role in. In this action here, the boundary term is not here. In this action, yeah, in this action, I already have boundary terms that I'm not writing down. Yeah. So in this expression, in, they are not included. They are not included, but they, they exist. Just 
yeah, I guess if you sit down and do the proper calculation, uh, you will find them. <laughs> Just to check this. Yes. Um, so the second, the second term is a two dimensional. Is it still minus, minus T over E? This one? In, in SL, in, your, in the original. Here? Yeah. No, here it's all, uh, well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> This always happens to me at the end of the two hours lecture. I start writing, well, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So let me write down uh, the action that we are left with after all these manipulations. Now I do have H, as you are saying, the Ricci scalar for H, and I do have. Uh, okay, let me write it down over here. So th this will be the, the Einstein term that will give this uh, topological contribution. This will have plus boundary. And then let me write it down over here. This will be our star equation for next time, one over 16 by G. Now I do not have the phi naught anymore over here. And instead of that, I get this action, uh, root h. I get the small dilaton over here. And I keep erasing. Next time I will have three blackboards to write in. And I get r h plus two, uh, plus another boundary term that can be written plus two, I, K, and here the boundary term just looks plus two, K. Okay, let's look a little bit at this action. So this first term is the term I was discussing before. It's topological. We will just uh, give some number proportional to the Euler characteristic for any metric. But this term now has, well, first it has an extra field, phi, that we call the dilaton field. And in higher dimensions, what it's telling us is how the size of the two sphere is changing as we move inside our ABS2 uh, space time. And it's pretty obvious, but we will discuss it next lecture. If we uh, compute the equations of motion for this phi, that will give us that r plus 2 is equal to 0. So that gives that r is equal to minus 2. And that uh, will constrain our geometry to be ABS. Um, and this is, well, and of course, I will have plus dot 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 higher order terms in phi, but for all our discussion, well, let's put order phi square for the discussion that is coming. Uh, all what will be important is this uh, JT gravity action, that again is an action for the metric and a scalar field that we call the dilaton and makes the usual topological trivial action, Einstein action in two dimensions, uh, non-trivial anymore. And it will have some interesting uh, features that eventually will be related to our quantum model uh, that will come afterwards. So that's all I wanted to tell you for today. Next lecture, we will just start from here. H will be G again. I will not have all these queer names and we will study basic properties of uh, this theory. Thank you. Questions? Huh. Nadal, what? when is the lecture going to be uploaded? I don't know. The person who will upload. <laughs>
Where are you? Where is it? Mine. Uh, in a couple of days. In a couple of days. Uh, pizzas will be arriving soon. I'm going to wait for them down test. Uh, How many pizzas? Just 10. <laughs> and also, I'm leaving the, uh, the, the, our, our email on the chat. So, if you have any comments from this, just sign up and we can have a conference. Is that still recording? Yeah. Yeah.